primary injustice against the world's revolutionaries, the world's freedom fighters, and particularly those who were doing their freedom fighting in the states of Latin America, was the oppression and the dictatorships themselves. The secondary injustice against these people was the subterfuge and the secrecy and the muddling of facts that followed these revolutionary events and that followed these revolutionary struggles to intentionally distort the severity of crimes perpetuated by other states or other actors. That is something we regret and we would, and we would support any art that tells the truth in its entire messy, visceral, disgusting complexity. That was what was going to help these people. That is what we would choose as a revolutionary artist in this debate. Three issues in this speech. Firstly, on who are we and characterization of the actor in this debate. The second, the second issue on why this galvanizes the masses in a way that abstract art does not. And the thirdly, on why this is gratifying for the artist in a way that abstract art is not. Who are we in this debate? The first thing to discern is that we are likely Latin American given the context that, that surrounds this debate. This debate. The, from states like Nicaragua and Venezuela and Panama and Cuba, who have struggled under various revolutionary and in various revolutionary ways over the years, and also have experienced massive levels of US interference in the form of the CIA ex like exercising coups within their sovereign borders. The second thing to note about this person is that they're likely, as a revolutionary and as an artist who is a, who is even contemplating this choice about the best way to express their revolutionary sentiments, is likely someone who is personally affected by violence, either directly or indirectly, like through a family member or friend or people around them. The third thing is to say is that they're obviously someone who is deeply passionate about change, deeply passionate about spurring revolution, deeply passionate about reaching people and affecting them. And affecting them. They're also deeply passionate about telling the truth. They the importance of this point is that this artist in particular is the kind of artist that would be willing to trade off, say, their own enjoyment in, their, in making their art for a higher purpose. And secondly, why this galvanizes the masses in a way that abstract art does not. The first thing of note here is that symbolism and abstract concepts are far more easily grasped and far more easily accessible by those with education, specifically often education in art or in literature. It takes study to understand the kind of symbolism and colour symbolism and like, you know, I, the, the only example that comes to mind is like alliteration, but you know, like literary techniques. It takes a lot of study, it takes an education in the first place. The second thing to note here is that it's intentionally often interwoven with other texts in forms of intertextuality that often they would have had to consume and may not have had access to. Note largely the working classes are the most oppressed people that, these people, that this revolutionary artist is trying to reach. Those people are uniquely locked out of this form of art and that is regrettable. The second thing though is that the people who would understand it, or the vast majority of the people who would understand this message, are positioned to be unsympathetic. That is within that state, it is likely the bourgeoisie, it is likely the intelligentsia who would understand this art, they are uniquely unsympathetic to, its unsympathetic to its message. The second thing under this heading is that even if they can understand something from the art, even if they can glean something at all, the first thing to say is there's likely to be less comprehension because the work itself is definitionally less clear. The second thing though is you cannot pack that much information, that, those important dates or that important number of people who are massacred, your people who are massacred, when you make abstract art as opposed to hyper-realistic uh, uh, hyper art. There is less information to glean from if you can glean anything at all. The third thing under this heading is that it is prone to outright mockery from external actors and that is a corrupting factor on the artist's message that was incredibly important. Imagine how you would feel if you were a revolutionary and you were an artist and you poured your heart and your soul into making this art and then someone from like some dumbass who like you know soft boy in a like in a college classroom in the west fucking laughed at it. Had the audacity to say that your art was invalid and that your art is wrong. That was not a personal attack, I promise. Um, <laughs> the fourth thing to note here is it's prone to outright manipula and manipulation. The first instance of this that is notable is that during the Cold War, for example, bear with me, the CIA specifically targeted and identified Soviet realism as the dominant form of art within the Soviet Union. They noticed that, say, communists, who were particularly prone to sympathising with the struggles of the working class, were also likely to present art in a way that told the truth more completely and more concretely. So, and in a hilarious turn of events, they propped up institutions like MoMA and they propped up artists like Jackson Pollock, whose art was more susceptible to manipulation and subterfuge of the message that those artists originally intended. That was a harm, again, personal harm to the artist and harm to the movement overall. That was something you likely cared about if you wanted to make not just art, but specifically revolutionary art. Like throwing paint at like throwing paint at a canvas might be really fun. It's not gonna make anyone throw down their tools and pick up 
be making. Note an example here is like the works of Goya during the Spanish Civil War is likely to, is that likely to cause visceral outrage, especially among people in your own in your own country who maybe were somewhat shielded from the violence, or international audiences who cared deeply about it, uh, who cared deeply about this part of the world, but did not know exactly what was happening. Now they know exactly what is happening. They cannot look away. They are captured by that viscera. They are captured by the bloodshed. They are captured. They are captured by the sheer and truthful representation of oppression that was important in this debate. Note then, thirdly in this speech, why this is gratifying for the artist in a way uniquely that of uh, abstract art is not. Noting what I told you at setup, which is that this artist is more prone than other artists and more accepting than other artists of trading off, say, their creative vibes and their creative will for a higher purpose. This is not someone who is just studying fine arts and wants to be a painter because they want to paint portraits of their cat. They are someone who is looking to create change in the world, and thus, if it creates change in the world, it is good enough for them. Note my previous issue in substantive. The first thing under this point is, like further though, is that they are highly likely to care about the principle of telling the truth. This is a person who has struggled, likely their entire life, or at the very least has watched those around them struggle in perpetuity with no apparent solution. They have, wa they have watched people die, they have watched people be injured, they have watched lives fall apart. They would likely care about telling the truth in all of that complexity far more than they would care about some symbolism that only some white guy with a college education is going to understand. The second thing though is that to create this kind of realist art specifically, you didn't need clout to begin with. No, my analysis about Jackson Pollock and how MoMA was felt like was like pushed into relevancy by the CIA and by other actors. If I throw random paint spiders at a canvas, no one fucking cares, and I'm like reasonably wealthy and live in the West. If you are a revolutionary in a developing country and you throw paint at a canvas, or you wrote, write some Ruby Core type poetry, no one is going to care. They will call you pretentious or they will not pay attention to you at all. You will not get shown in galleries, your poetry will not be read, your books will not be read, that was bad. If you are and you know, and you don't obviously need any prior like clout to write to like you know paint incredibly visceral images of battlefields. The third thing to say here is that that outrage pro like propels that response to art. Note that Goya, everyone, that when Goya released his, his etchings of the Spanish Civil War, everyone was disgusted by them, but they are still in relevancy today in art because we cared about them, because we were outraged, and we were viscerally upset by them. The third thing to note, and lastly in this speech, is people will not laugh at you for it. And fifthly, and which is good for you, but fifthly, fellow revolutionaries, the people that you needed to perhaps lay down their life for you or your, their life for your common cause, will respect you far more if you commemorate their, their, your fallen comrades, if you commemorate your cause and your struggle. That was what was important to this artist, and that is why we have got a long way in winning this today. Proud to propose. If it is true that facts are being heavily suppressed, then it is also likely to be true that art that tells those facts, names and dates are also likely to be suppressed and heavily, heavily censored, thereby being useless to the revolution. A couple of points of setup before I get on to my speech. We think that the objective type of art that we're talking about here is names, dates, events and numbers. We think that the context for this Thus, these are relied upon their own context and they're being about factual. In terms of abstract art, we don't think this is necessarily like an interpretive dance. We think that it's art that just doesn't relate to specific facts, names, dates. We think that is something in which it's likely to be true, particularly considering how it's something that can be divorced from its current context and how it's something which stands in opposition to extensionismo, which is so, so can careful about the facts, dates, and names, and being so explicit with what it is directly referring to. We think abstract art just is less explicit as to what it is referring to. So we think something that the art we're actually talking about is things like, for instance, say, a painting of a woman who is depressed in poverty, and we think that is something that is more relevant in this abstract art compared to, say, this 47 women were shot and killed by this revolutionary force or something. So we think that's what we're looking at and what this really, really looks like. So, what do we care about as revolutionary artists? We think number one, and most importantly, we probably care about a successful revolution. 
we reckon that as a revolutionary, that's our goal, and we think that comes, we would much, much rather that than anything else. Secondly, we probably care to some extent about staying alive, and I'll get onto this and why this relates to the first point, but we reckon that as a revolutionary, and as a revolutionary actor with some influence, we reckon that us staying alive will probably lead to a more successful revolution. Thirdly, we reckon we probably care about internationalism. Like as the affirmative said, we're probably in Latin America, we're probably socialists, so we probably care about the common human struggle rather than just an individual thing that happens in our country. This leads me to two points of substantive. One, why this leads to a better revolution. Well, we reckon that art is a really, really critical player in a revolution. We think that in these dictatorships, you're often against, you're often formal expressions of politics, it's repressed, so you don't have the right to free speech, you don't have the right to political assembly. We think that art has a way of cutting through this. We think in particular, subtle art can do this. So, art can be subtle and art can get through this. So, we think that when you have to be specific, when you have to name the facts and the atrocities and everything that went on, it's very clear to the population and to the government and the censorship laws as to what you're trying to do. It's very clear that you're making some anti-revolutionary art. It's also very clear as to what that art is particularly opposed to. So, for instance, this might look something like something about the Tiananmen Square massacre. It might be a painting of Tiananmen Square and the events that actually took place, rather than, say, a more abstract interpretation of that. The next thing to say here is that this means this art, as I flagged in my intro, will be cracked down upon, will not be distributed amongst the populace. If it is distributed amongst the populace and is found by the, other, and is found by the authorities, the people who have used the art are likely to be executed. The people who made the art, us, are likely to be executed. We don't think that this is a particularly useful way of distributing amongst the revolution, particularly then, because then the authorities know anyone with this art is a revolutionary. We think, however, if we were able to have an abstract form of art, which plays upon more subtle motifs, metaphors and themes, they would be able to, one, they would be able to relate to people in a different way, and we feel the people are able to relate to them with their own experience. So for instance, if there is a piece of art that's really, really concrete, saying that this uh, person was killed for this reason in, like, on the 17th of June, we think that that has a limiting factor compared to a more subtle piece of art, not related to any one specific circumstance, in which it was able to connect with the populace, where they were able to feel, yes, my brother's been killed, I can relate to that, rather than this individual one person was killed, and we think that's more likely to be done. The next thing to say here, which we thought was particularly important, because it was likely that it would be about common themes, not just about intertextuality as they were trying to portray it as, but particularly common themes of human struggle, human decency, and human rights, we thought it was likely something that, considering we want our art to be successful for the revolution, we were going to make it so that it could be accessed by all, accessed by the working class, so we didn't feel that it was going to be exclusionary. We felt the exclusion came when we added details and when we ignored people. The next thing to say here is we thought it was more likely it was going to get past censorship laws because art relates to one's individual experience. So if we take the example of a woman in poverty, we felt that people who are living in that same situation were more likely to see that as revolutionary, whereas the censor, who comes from a more privileged background, probably not going to, and so probably likely that that might get passed. And importantly here, more of that will get passed under our side than under their side, where it is so obvious what the art is about and how revolutionary it is. So it provides plausible deliability. This means that it means for the artist, the artist is safer. That's important because if the artist, if the artist gets killed, then they can no longer make art. Any art that they've distributed up until then is their only art that they can make. Comparatively, if the artist has plausible deliability or isn't caught in the first place, they are able to distribute more and more art. So even if this art was less impactful, which it's not, you would be able to have so much more art that it would become so much more impactful. So, at the end of that, we thought that it was going to be better for the revolution for more abstract art. The next thing to say here is that we thought abstract art was in particular more impactful. We thought that graphic art connects to people on an, intel on, like an intellectual level. It's saying, this regime murders people. Comparatively, we thought that um, other forms of art like, would be more emotional because it was able to cut through that by not kidding with facts and logic, but instead trying to, instead, try to put like emotion in there, trying to have some sort of symbolism in there to allow people to interpret their own meaning into that art. 
Importantly here, because meaning comes from your own experiences and the shared experience of a desire for a new government here was going to have to be very, very important. We've looked at a couple of reasons why we'd like this trip. One, because it's not about a specific situation, thus it's not exclusive. And two, because people were able to relate it and position themselves within that R. Something that was not able to be done under objective R. People could not position themselves inside that R. That was particularly bad for a number of reasons. So, the next thing to say here, and why this would be more impactful, we reckon that revolutionary art is characterised by a couple of things. One, we reckon that revolutionary art is particularly useful later in time for your own country. We think that revolutions do take a long time, just one empirically, but two, because you're going through a massive social upheaval and you have to get the groundwork. So that's why if you're trying to pin something on one massacre now, it's not going to be as effective as if you can have something that's timeless. But then secondly, because of the international approach, you can actually have something that's spaceless. So if you're trying to say this Russian government is really, really bad, that's not as important as if you're able to say when the capitalist oppresses us, we, we, we get uh, pressure or something. Com compare that when you're able to provide for everyone across the common world shared experience. You're able to connect revolutions in the same way that the Russian and Cuban ones were influenced by each other and the French and Russian ones. So we thought at the end of the day, you would have this unifying experience that was able to make more impactful art and more revolutionary art in general. Thanks very much. When the first negative speaker of this debate talks about how facts and logic and concrete details are just never going to be as emotionally compelling as abstract art, I would like to ask the audience a question. Which do you remember more? Which are you more emotionally affected by? The napalm girl photograph or a Jackson Pollock painting? I think the answer for the majority of people in the world today would probably be the image of the most visceral war crime, one of the most visceral war crimes that humanity has predicted. And because of that, and because of the inability of the negative team to recognize that like, people will relate to anecdotes sometimes, they lose the debate. Firstly, in regards to characterization and correcting the incredibly uncharitable characterization of abstract art that they want to talk about in this set. I think the idea that like abstract and that the art we are proposing in this debate has to necessarily be just like the most dispassionate retelling of objective facts in all of civilization is a little bit uncharitable given the fact that they clearly do not respect their own mandate as the negative to defend like actual abstract art. Which is not to say that things like science fiction can't be propped under outside the house, since things like or things like Banksy say, which are clearly not abstract art, but are still like revolutionary in some way. I think those are things we are perfectly proud and capable of propping under outside the house. But even if we take the very, very uncharitable burden that is given to us by the negative team in this debate, then the retelling of facts and numbers in a way in which is emotionally compelling is called journalism. And I think that you'll find it is immensely emotionally compelling to a number of people to hear things like war reporting on a day-to-day -day basis. So that intuitively, even before I get to my more substantive rebuttal of their completely nonsense claims on this, still should tell you that even at the very worst, we are still capable of getting a whole lot of things that they do not get on the best side of the house. Second of all, in terms of characterization, I would like to also talk about the fact that, like, the, talking about, you know, how the artist should be more concerned with their ability to live and carry on, I think that is a ridiculous notion given the fact that as you become a revolutionary, you yourself must necessarily accept, especially in particularly volatile regions like um, Latin America, yeah, that you are necessarily putting yourself in a lot of danger by holding these views, by espousing these views. And because of that, I think the priorities that this artist would have would certainly not necessarily prioritize like their own sort of well-being as much as the negative team would like you to believe. So actually moving on to some more concrete and structured rebuttal, I think firstly addressing the biggest push in this debate, which is that abstract art which is more likely to get through sense of it. Firstly, I think this point was already flagged in my previous points about how the characterization of um, non-abstract art is incredibly ungenerous, but let me make it clear here, there are still ways that non-abstract art can in fact get past senses, yeah? Coding exists, for example, as a way to disguise experiences under the guise of significantly more benign ones that are not particularly forbidden by the government. Things like clear coded fiction often slip past senses, since people do not recognize the language of an experience that they themselves want to erase, yeah? But second of all, right, even if we ignore our ability to promote things like relatively, um, not necessarily li completely liberal art, but still not abstract art, I think the second thing to say here, right, is that if you are a revolutionary artist, there is presumably a government blog of you somewhere committing revolutionary um, practices, being involved with the revolution. So it is very likely, then, that they would not assume that a work of art produced by a revolutionary would not have revolutionary ideas, yeah? Presumably, if you are so concerned about your well-being that the government is, like, 
so worried that your art should be censored, then they will probably censor it either way, because it is not that difficult to find out if someone is a revolutionary or not, especially if you yourself, as a good revolutionary, want to keep pushing the message of revolution forward. So, finally, I think, as a final last-ditch mitigatory point, I would like to point out there is practically no value in putting out the kinds of toothless tiger abstract art forms that the negative team wants to talk about in this debate, because it is practically impossible, for all the reasons that Connor gives you, that these kinds of people actually relate to the art that you are giving them. If what you are putting out is ultimately substanceless, is ultimately completely unrelatable to the proletariat you are trying to whip into a revolutionary fervor, then I would argue that as a revolutionary artist, it would betray your very own ideals to like, surrender so completely to the government that you hate, that you would be willing to like, even to be willing to like, get your art out into the public consciousness at the risk of everything you want in your art being completely stripped away from it. So second of all, moving on to, you know, how effective is the art in this instance? Two points here. Firstly, whether or not the message is clear, and second of all, whether or not it will reach people. I think firstly in regards to whether or not the message is clear. Um, Nate makes a push here about like, you know, maybe, um, maybe having common themes makes it more accessible for the average audience, you know, if they have something more broad and abstract to relate to as opposed to something concrete. As I already flagged in my introduction, it is ridiculous to assert that people do not relate to things like anecdotes. People use examples of its personal experience all the time to demonstrate to people as part of a larger pattern as like why they should not do something, why they should do something, you know? This isn't even like emotionally sympathizing. This is just like broader pattern recognition. And the implication that humans cannot somehow discern that, like, you know, oh, maybe I can empathetically relate to something which is similar to something that has happened in my own life, even though it is not exactly the same, is completely absurd from the negative team. So, what are we left with in this debate? Connor gives you a number of important pushes here, which is that abstract art is very difficult to pass meaningfully to an outsider to the art world, and it's also very easy to pass apolitically because it does not carry an immediately obvious coherent message. We point to the example of the fact that, you know, what do people remember about the banana duct tape to the wall? They just remember that it was eaten, yeah? Not that it had any kind of greater political significance. <laughs> Second of all, representational art and counterfactual is blunt and direct and intuitive to pass, more effective broadly, yeah? People remember things, people, I think, would probably remember things that are incredibly blunt and in your face, things like direct war coverage of things like the Vietnam War, as examples of the representational horror that these kinds of experiences bring to people, the hard numbers, the hard truths, that come with things that are immensely devastating to these people's lives. I think that the impact here, right, is that if you put out a piece of art with a less clear message, you feel like you are betraying your own principles, you feel like you are being less true to self. And as an artist, what do you live for if not for the ability to express your own ideas in the works you put out? Second of all, in the idea of whether or not it will reach people. Then, um, firstly, the idea that abstract art Firstly, we tell you that abstract art effectively ha having an audience in the first instance depends on you having a pre-existing plan. Pointing to, again, Connor's example about how someone who is not internationally recognized in the art world would not get a lot of recognition for doing things like painting a single blue dot on the canvas, whereas people who are already internationally renowned, who already have all that clout, are recognized. So it means that it is harder for these kinds of people to actually break out, and therefore, like, much less likely it will get to any people in the first instance. But the second thing is that representational art is broadly accessible to a number of people, yeah? Photography and portraits still get recognition from institutions, even though they come from relative nobodies. I would point to things like, for example, pictures of a woman holding, the picture of a woman holding her children in the wake of the dust bowl. Again, the napalm girl. All of these things kind of point to the fact that even though they may not be, like, traditionally recognized as art, even though they may be outside the traditional art institutions, the traditional art institutions, which, as on states, presumably reject someone who comes from a revolutionary background, all of these instances, I think, seem to point out the fact that if you want to make abstract art, it's incredibly difficult for you to actually get recognition for it and actually get the audience that you would need in order to, um, in order to get, um, be made accessible on a broader scale. And so because of that, the impact here is that under our side of the house, you're significantly more capable of getting a message into the consciousness as it stands, whereas under their side of the house, your, your message may be completely unclear, except to people who have an active vested interest in opposing you because they come from the establishment that you work so hard to oppose. Finally, even in the very, very worst case scenario, um, like, even in the very, very worst case scenario, yeah, of our art gets completely suppressed, our art is no longer like found out even in our lifetime, while as their art gets through. I think we have already done enough work to prove that even this kind of factual is significantly more um even this kind of factual is significantly better than the one they get on the best side. Which is better, right? To be remembered as someone who ultimately did nothing. To be remembered as someone for like whom your revolutionary comrades believe, like you are depicting their experience in an unserious way, in a way in which they do not find emotionally compelling at all. Or would you rather be remembered, even if you are not known now, because your art has been suppressed, maybe in like 50, 100 years time, the significance of your art will still be preserved if it is not being completely outright destroyed. 
because of the fact that we just give you a significantly more sensible explanation for how people like cast art, because of the fact that we recognize that humans have patent recognition and like empathy and shit, I think we are immediately ahead in this debate. <laughs> Jonah says that their art is Banksy, it's methods like coding, it's photographs and poems, but our art is just a Jackson Pollock painting. That is ridiculous. <laughs> Abstract art is not crazy, bizarro, interpretive dancing. It is literally, as Sibian told you, and as the info slide tells you, it's just anything without specific detail. That is what the info slide makes clear by defining non-abstract art as stuff with specific detail. That is why, that's like the factually accepted definition. That's what Simeon told you and explained why. And that's ultimately why we are the side that can claim paintings like of the Napalm Girl, because that doesn't have specific detail of events and data. That is why we can claim things like coding and methods like that to hide symbols and make them more easily accessible. That's literally what abstract art is. And that is why ultimately we're going to win this debate. Because these guys have pinned all of their analysis and points on an incredibly uncharitable analysis of our art as being literally nothing and their art as being literally everything. And that is what I'm going to disprove. I'm going to do that in three questions of rebuttal. Firstly, how prevalent can abstract art be compared to objective art? Secondly, what is the effectiveness of abstract art compared to objective for the revolution, both domestically and internationally? And then finally, what is the impact of abstract art or pursuing that on the individual artists and what they actually care about? Let's first look at the prevalence, because we give you a lot of time and effort at Simeon explaining why you can correct may, way, way more abstract art. That is the two main problems. The first is that specific objective art has a clear intention, which may be obvious to the individual, but it's also obvious to the government, and then they will just stamp it out. And then, you know, it, you cannot just claim otherwise, because one, they have massive incentives to do that. They're in power, they want to quell the revolution, they want to keep it that way. But secondly, they have the unique ability to do that because they control the state, they control, you know, often the media, often, you know, if you're revolting against your government, likely they do have a whole heap of control, and they're able to do things like take down graffiti and whatever. And so, you know, and if you're doing it behind closed doors, this objective specific art, it's just not effective enough that won't reach enough people to be important. So specific objective art cannot be effective, and if it is poised to be effective, it will be immediately removed. Comparatively, Smee tells you that abstract art is not the same, because it can contain things like hidden symbols and phrases, you can get around censorship, you can plausibly deny meaning, and importantly and uniquely, meaning is subjective in a way which means that the average person can relate it to their own experiences in a revolutionary context, but a government official does not, because they do not have the revolutionary context, they have a different perspective, so they don't automatically think of it as revolutionary art, rather they ignore it and think it's innocent. They have two responses to this. The first is that second, well they're both at second, when Jonah says the methods like coding and whatever are effective. One, that is our case. But two, if you want to point to things like methods of coding as being effective, that totally gets rid of all of their material about how uh, abstract art is unaccessible and that by watering it down it gets really, really bad and ineffective. Because if they want to say that that's true, then presumably also methods like coding would not be effective. The fact that Jonah is swayed to our side on this indicates that you know, watering things down can be beneficial in a revolutionary context. The second thing they say is that they'll find out that you're revolting on either side. This is garbage, because if they knew on the outside or either side, you'd be dead right now. As I said, they have incentives to take you out, to at least put you behind bars, and so under either side, presumably the state has not worked out you're a revolutionary. Under their side, they work out pretty damn quickly, under, and so they throw you in jail or they get rid of you, again, incentives and ability. But under our side, at least you can continue under a pseudonym, under a code name, or at the very least you don't even need to do that, because your art isn't instantly perceived as being potentially dangerous to the state. What that means is, we have far, far more ability to make art under our side, which has two foreign benefits. One, to the revolution as a whole, it means that you're able to make more art that can inspire, sorry, that can inspire people, that can bring people into the revolution, that can educate people, which obviously is good for the revolution, that's something this person would care about. But secondly, it's just comforting. And this is quite important, because under either side, it is really hard to take the revolution down. Even, you know, especially when we're dealing with one person as an actor. What that means is, if this person can just make art that can be placed in people's rooms, that can be on the street, and that people can wake up every day and see, that gives them some glimmer of hope in their lives, when neither side is going to be able to bring down the revolution, that is a massive benefit to us, and that is something that presumably this artist is going to care about, because that's perhaps the only way that you can get comfort in a realistic sense. So that's why we get much more art, which obviously has flow and effects when you're talking about the effectiveness of that art in terms of you know, the revolution, but I'm going to deal with everything else that was said under this issue. So we give you a number of reasons why it's effective domestically. That is that firstly, it's uniquely universally appealing. So they say that you, cannot, you, you can relate to stats, 
more than you can relate to emotional things, but we tell you that it's much harder to project yourself onto stats and experiences because they're specifically exclusive. They only apply to a certain group of people. In the same way that a photo like the napalm girl, everyone can put their face there. You can't put your face on a statistic or a lived experience. But secondly, be comparative. Under both sides, presumably, uh, you, it, it, you know, our burden is not to prove necessarily that you can relate to stats or you can't relate to emotions, merely that ours is slightly more approachable, and so we think we're likely to fulfill that burden. When Simeon tells you about the generational effect and that revolutions are often built on the backs of previous generation symbols, which is again another reason why it's important to be abstract and why you can substitute your own meaning and experiences. We wish to tell that's more, more novel and able to capture attention, is that's not politically confrontational, it's emotional, not intellectual, and then all those reasons also apply internationally, which has a massive benefit. They give us a number of things in response. Specifically, especially Connor, they give us four main lines of argumentation. The first is that abstract art is high art. It requires education, intertextuality, but only the bourgeoisie will get it. Which is, again, a complete mischaracterization of what we're dealing with when we say abstract art. It's not bizarro, it's just the same art that they want to talk about without specific details. Like, it can still be a poem, it can still be a painting, it can still be graffiti. That's something that you don't need, you know, five years in art school to understand. That's not something that the bourgeoisie will inherently have an advantage in understanding. Again, complete mischaracterization. The second thing that they say is that it's not as informative. But this is not important. Because if you're in a position where you're seeing this art, you probably do know what's up. You probably do know about the brutality of the regime because you've lived in it for a number of years. You probably do know about the massacre. You probably do know about the atrocity. So you don't need to be informed. But also, information itself is off-putting. And they say that that's a benefit, but it absolutely isn't. Because as Simeon tells you, it means people don't want to associate with the revolution, and it's less likely to be shown at art galleries and get the effectiveness that they want to talk about. The third thing they say is that it's prone to mockery. This is just not true. Again, it's not bizarre art. But secondly, maybe that's true in a Western sense, but there's a difference between mocking abstract art in a Western museum, because you find it kind of funny, versus mocking art that is produced in a time of turmoil from a position of desperation. I don't think the average person would go so far as to mock that. That's incredibly insensitive and untrue. The fourth thing and final thing they say is that it's prone to manipulation. But again, it only gets manipulated if the, threat, if the state sees it as a threat that needs manipulation, which is why it's, it's you know, relevant to the first issue. And given that it's so obviously a threat, that is what gets manipulated. Given that ours is not, it won't. That's why it's better for uh, the revolution. Let's talk about the individual artists. We tell you that they're going to be much safer under our side because of all the reasons I've already gone through in that first issue. And that, they say that you don't care about that. What? Like, you do care about that. We're literally talking about your life. That is probably something that you hold incredibly dearly. It is something that you hold perhaps dear, more dearly than literally anything else. And just because you put the foot forward to become a revolutionary doesn't mean you're willing to die for that cause. But also, if they do want to make that burden on us, life equals revolution. You can only contribute to the revolution insofar as you're alive. So if they do want to place that burden on us, they lose again. So ultimately, all roads lead to Rome. They really care about their safety and their life. And, you know, because of all the analysis that we've done, they're much more likely to die to get killed or be taken away under their side. They actually tell you this is good for the individual for three reasons. The first is that they're happy to trade off art for the success of the revolution. Completely contingent, not true, I've proven why. The same thing they say is that they're likely to care about telling the truth. But I think they care about both the revolution and their safety more, in that they're happy to lie to the government, they're probably happy to lie to people they don't agree with, and we think the primary goal they have is to win the revolution. And in fact, I think Connor and Jonah both clearly prioritise that in their speeches. I think it's clear that that's true. They also obviously care about their safety over telling the truth, probably because it's their safety. And you're still expressing the truth in an abstract way, so it's not particularly clear what the harm is. The final thing they say is that they want to create clout, but again, it's not clear why that's important, and you don't get that clout being dead, and so it completely goes back to the first issue. Ultimately, we create far more art and it's far better for the safety of that individual. But even if you don't believe that, our art is just better. It is more appealing, it is more effective. That is why we're winning this debate. Let's just clarify what abstract means. It means that it is not representing or reflecting what the natural universe is. That is to say that it's not anything that has form in the real world. It is what you can think of that can like, capably take form on a page. That's what abstract art is. But even if they can capture arts like you know Banksy's form of art, Let's be clear, it is far better to have art that necessarily evokes a visceral reaction to see hundreds slaughtered or at the very least people devastated and people on the streets dead because that is what the state and oppressors are doing to you. You should be informed by that, you should be evoked by that, and that's what we do for you. 
I'll ask two, three questions in your speech. Firstly, how is art internalised? Second, can this art be disseminated? And thirdly, on the movement and what, what this type of art will do to you, or at the very least, which art is better for you and the movement. On to the first issue, how is art internalised? Because they told you that, well, you know, you can't internalise, you know, like, so, like, you know, census spreadsheets. This doesn't make much sense, because obviously we're propping art, so it's literal depictions of people dead and people dying. So you will see the brush strokes of people and the red of the blood flowing through the streets, it will still be artwork, it's almost as if it's a photograph, you know that there is death, you know that there is devastation, there is destruction, it is just that it is accurate description of what death and devastation happened in the, in, in, in the, real, in, in the real world. Now, we, we told you down the bench that actually, when you had art like this, it was better consumed, because firstly, people who liked education were capable of seeing this, I don't think people who have, like, you know, people, you need to probably go to, like, a really good, fine art school to fully understand the complexities of the way in which abstract art is, is, is made. We also told you, secondly, that it is better consumed insofar as it is literally not informative. You can count how many people the state slaughtered in that gunfire. It is not true that people will not understand what happened as a result of this oppression. We also told you implicitly that pain is necessarily something that is universal. People in the image experience it, so it is likely that you are capable of also experiencing it, so you are capable of like, creating a relation with that person in the image, so it is not true that you are incapable of being able to connect to that art. The, we also told you that it is very difficult for a very unknown person to just throw abstract art onto a wall and see whether or not it, like paint sticks and then get clapped. Obviously you needed some sort of pre-clap in order to actually make your abstract art stick. What did they say in response? I see you getting a bit bored edges. So, firstly, they said Said. Well, the negative can stand for depressed paintings of women. You know, they just don't need to provide details. Firstly, this is a concession to our side, because we are the side that is propping active and accurate depictions of what happens in an oppressive state. Secondly, I would say that you don't, you cannot necessarily capture this burden, so like, even if, like, so I, I said that it was a concession, but actually you just can't have this, 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 this benefit because it is not abstract art. The second thing that they said in response to the internalization of art is that, well, you know, you can't insert yourself into realistic art. This is incredibly untrue. It's like like in Game of Thrones in that scene where the guy got stabbed in the eye, obviously people felt like a visceral reaction to like, you know, like touch their eye. People see pain in other individuals and are capable of empathising. Empathy is an intrinsic part of human nature in order to maintain some sort of social survival. It is ingrained in us and we all feel it. If you see someone on the street dying, it is more than likely that you will feel someone, uh, feel, feel it. That's why I feel a bit bad when I see people who are homeless on the street with no money in the cafe and are asking people to put money into. So obviously, subconscious empathy mechanises visceral anger in these people, therefore we are capable of evoking emotion. The third thing that they said is that you cannot import your own meaning because like, you know, it's like realism and you can't import what you think it could be. Good. The reality was that the state killed this number of people and you should be aware of that. You should know that that occurred and you should be angry. The fourth thing that they said is, well, more, more art is better. Firstly, quality over quantity here, because obviously we can evoke more people to be effective to take up arms against the state or vote for candidates that are going to move against the repressive regime. So obviously, if our art is more effective in evoking anger, which I told you it will be, it is more likely that you are capable of having the thing that they talked about, which is actual change. Quantity does not make any sense. Also, we think, um, you know, actually, I'll move on. Uh, well, fifthly, I would say that like, you, like they say that you can't relate to statistics, but obviously it's not a census spreadsheet. You are obviously relating to a visual painting of an art of, of, like, of, of what happened in your life. But secondly, even if you have Bans Banksy, I would prefer a picture of people being slaughtered as what the state did, as opposed to just an image of graffiti, because it is less relatable for people, less empathy is evoked. Sec at the conclusion of that, obviously abstract art is less capable of being internalized than our art. The second issue I'll talk about is can this art be disseminated. We told you that you can better galvanise victims and sympathisers of victims onto our side insofar as it is disseminated, noting that I proved that it was effective art to be able to uh, galvanise people. The first thing they said in response is that, well, you can't get benefits given that the oppressors have incentives to suppress this art, for example, through censorship and executions. Firstly, we can obviously use VPNs onto our side, so it's likely that 
that they're going to upload this art onto the internet so people can access this art. But secondly, there are also underground galleries so that people can go to. Note that this is a revolutionary, and it is likely that this is occurring in a, in a nation that needs to revolt against an oppressive, an oppressive actor. So there are, are underground activities going on, so it's likely you have those kind of galleries. But secondly, insofar as like, you know, like oppression, suppression occurs, this is symmetric, because they talk about subtle motifs. I'm pretty sure politicians and oppressors understand subtle motifs, so are likely to also know which art to suppress, no matter if it is, even if it is abstract and they get it. And even if they didn't understand the motifs, they can obviously just pay people to tell them what the motifs mean, so that they can educate themselves about what they need to suppress. Thirdly, I would say that we can copy our art so that we can live on. As I told you, you can upload it to the internet, but people can literally replicate your art by copying it. Abstract art is less capable of being copied. The second thing that they said is that, well, safety matters. You know, you keep providing art to the revolution and with, with plausible deniability keeping you alive. Firstly, at second, we proved why it was un un unimportant. You were ready to die, you were a revolutionary, you were more than likely hating these, these oppressors, they probably took things from you, they killed parts of your family or they killed people you cared about, you probably wanted these people to die and you were happy to die in the process with it. But secondly, I would say that our art is adoptable upon death, that is to say that it has very conventional techniques, whereas your art is just like shit on the wall, so therefore, life is necessarily in our art because it necessarily can be depicted and copied under our side because it is more realistic. At the conclusion of that, this art can be disseminated, and at the very least, even if suppression occurs, that is symmetric. Let's turn to the third issue about the movement and you. This is whether the most was unresponsive. Like I, I, I color code like what they say in orange. There's only like not, there's no orange on this page. Well, there is a bit, but it's not relevant. But we would say that like the movement is necessarily harmed, and you are harmed insofar as you are capable of mockery. Let's be clear. At Connor, we told you people will not respect your art because it is literally just like paintings on the wall, or at the very least, it is comparatively less respectable than our art, which is realistic and is necessarily the depiction of what happens in real life. That delegitimizes you, it delegitimizes your movement, less people are galvanized, and even if galvanized is at best symmetric, yours is slow, ours is immediate because people are angry, people take up arms, or at the very least, want to see where they can take up arms. The minute they see that art, that is what you should weigh in this debate, the active a a like action to take up arms against the oppressors. Note that the, at, the, at the point, of, at this point, their revolution is not potent, their revolution is capable of suppression, our revolution is potent and is capable of galvanization. urge you to affirm. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> This debate about what is abstract art is honestly one of the most boring things I've ever talked about, and so I'm just going to skip it. And I'm going to do it that side didn't. I'm going to accept that ridiculous characterization. I'm going to take the hardest burn for our side and say that our case is exclusively Jackson Pollock, and I'm still going to explain my win this debate. So, the first thing to note here is that we are an artist, and we make very clear that if you post things that are like, for example, a bunch of people being trolled in the streets, that the government will crack down upon that because they have incentives to do so. They give us a couple of responses where that won't occur. Their first response said that you can code it. Note that is literally the definition of abstract art if you are coding things in terms of symbolism. And note, secondly, that this is a massive contradiction within their case, in that at the point in time where you are hiding from symbolism, you're making things deeply complicated, then you do require fine art to understand it according to their logic. So note that those two things were intention. But thirdly, and I think this is importantly, that they say things like you can use VPN. Again, this is kind of the last five seconds of Street, but secondly, is something which is deep and clear. Because if you look at, say, in like China or something, the people who have VPNs are generally the wealthy people who have access to computers, who have access to the internet, who have access to things like community programs like VPNs. Those are people who want a revolution. It's generally the poor working class people who are suffering the most, who are likely to want that. But secondly, a VPN is not perfect. China doesn't crack down on VPNs because they know they don't have to because there's a small fringe of people and they're happy for like a wealthy elite to have to use things like Facebook. If it is something that actually threatens them, they'll be more than happy to do that because the amount of control they have over these type of uh, things. The next thing they claim is going to do underground galleries. Now this, this I really love because number one, these are poor working class people who don't understand fine art. But they're also going to go underground to watch a gallery of paintings. 
But secondly, the fact that this would be incredibly easy to find because you're having a mass effect if you move to the same space, it would obviously be easy to repress. People have informants. And, and, and thirdly, uh, anyone who goes here would say, I'm actually do so because they know that the risk is death and the advantage of seeing some art. That is not a calculus that any working class person would make in that <laughs> situation. So clearly, the government would be able to crack down on that. What is the impact? It means that if you make this type of art and you put it in public, you will either be in prison for life or you will die. That doesn't happen to people like Ai Weiwei, tons of other artists that are very famous. The, the, the important to note there is that that is really bad for you. And they say, well, maybe you're happy to die for the revolution. Okay, in your best case scenario, maybe you are happy to die. But I think you'd probably prefer it if you didn't. And I think secondly, most people don't want to die because they value things in life. A couple of things I'm going to note here. Firstly, you can have a life after the revolution. You can be a person with interests. You can be a person with a family, a person with friends, a person with children who you care about. And secondly, you can contribute to the revolution in other ways other than your art. You can be canvassing in your local community. You can be working and helping homeless people because you probably care about social justice if you're a revolutionary. There are other things in your life to spy your art. And it's ridiculous to see you give up all of that up just to make one painting. That is an absolutely ludicrous characterization of how these people work. And that even assumes they're willing to get their life in their first place, which again is a mass fast, because most people would never want to do that. So, the important thing to note here is that, yeah, and the second thing they say is, well, you can create your art because even if you die, it can benefit the root revolution later on. Firstly, that's not true, because if you die, you can't make more art. They say you can put this art on the internet. Firstly, these are not like famous artists who have tons of people like following them and documenting their work. These are likely small cells of people in communities who don't have access to the internet. Even if they do, you know someone who's going to you know, you know, get some technical team scanned, put it on a VPN. Like, that's an absolutely ludicrous characterization. But even in their best case, sure, people put a, an artwork on, on like, which website? I don't know. Like, does anyone view that? Does anyone else have a good VPN and look at that? Like, it is, the marginal benefit there is incredibly small. But importantly, this is about the choice the artist makes. The artist is uh, deeply un like, fearful that they will be able, able to make that choice. They don't know if you're going to look at their art after they die. Would you have a risk the chance of your life on the chance that maybe some of your, your painting like 10 years later on Ricky Howard? I don't think you probably would. So, at the end of this, the important thing to note here is that you as an artist would never make this choice because you don't want to die, because you probably have a family and other interests you care about, and also you know that your ability to have revision is contingent upon you being alive. That means that even if it's a Jackson Pollock painting, and that the benefit is incredibly marginal to revolution of you existing, you still choose it because it's still a better choice for you. Now, we can dispel with this ridiculous characterization of Jackson Pollock and talk about the real debate, which is one that actually has to exist on fair grounds. So, what is abstract art? They say abstract art has to be weird, bizarre things that aren't tied to reality. That is just not true. And look, this debate isn't defined around what is abstract art, but rather, it's defined what's not abstract art, it's an inflow site. And that is things with specific details or characteristics or figures. That is what your site props, our site saying props, send this alternative to that. So what we're popping is things that aren't as specific, that aren't as time specific location, and aren't that tied to speak time. That doesn't mean that you kind of like a human in our photos, like you have to do some weird, you know, banana in a wall. Just think, for example, we display a woman in extreme poverty, and that is a calling to other people that the situation they live in right now is deep and untenable, and things need to change. So, what are the implications of this? Let's talk about effectiveness. Firstly, we get better effectiveness because we actually get to expand this into the community as I proved, as I proved before, because people actually get to access this art. But secondly, this art is more inclusive on a general level because it relates to everyone's shared issues in that society. But secondly, because it's intergenerational, because maybe the art of this specific event at one time can relate to people who were there, but it cannot relate to people who followed it on. And no, revolutions take time, they are not immediate, therefore it's important to relate to other generations. But thirdly, you know, that as a revolutionary, you establish that it wasn't contested. You probably care about other countries other than yourself, and therefore you want to appeal to something that's universal. For that reason alone, you get far more reach on the outside. The next thing, and then probably their biggest push at the first point, is to say, well, this art is done more effective. So let's talk about effectiveness. They say this appeals to you on a more visceral level. So, I think maybe, maybe that is true, uh, maybe that is true at some level, but the important thing to note here is that, um, sorry, yeah, so they say it's going to appeal to you on a visceral level. And maybe that's true, but I think the important thing to note in this debate is that you have to weigh different comments. So, even if taking their best case scenario and we say that it's going to be the split type of art they are the third as opposed to the first, and say it's going to be something like really visceral art, number one, no one is going to see that because it's unlikely to document in the public. 
Two, you were never created in the first place, you were never created in anything, you were dumb. The alternative is something which is maybe less effective, like say art that treats women in poverty, art that depicts a society that's ragged and burning, but that art is actually far more widespread. Our art is more widespread for a couple of reasons. It is because, as we said before, number one, uh, there's plausible deniability because you can say it's not necessarily revolutionary, it depicts my day to day existence, and secondly, because the government correlates their lived experience as what working people can. Their only response is that like the government is kind of smart, but like in some cases that is true, but when it's on a very local level, a local inspector is not going to be able to understand these type of things are necessarily not. So, at the end of this debate, no two things. Note one, that maybe you're not promising the world, we are promising some marginal change. And also and note that in both sides of state, revolution is unlikely, as Alex says, but at least understand we give a glimmer of hope. Under their side, what they do is this never happens in the first place because it's deeply unrealistic. People don't publish it because it's deeply unrealistic. And if they do, they die, which is the worst case scenario for protest in this debate. Revolutionary art is good, but it needs to be art that actually helps revolution, and that's what it does.